Welcome to Concordia Theological Seminary and our lectionary podcast for this, the baptism of our Lord. And the text we're going to be looking at today is the Old Testament text from uh, Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, the first book of the Torah, of course, Genesis, also called or known better in the Hebrew as Bereshith, which deals with, of course, the, the first the first word of the Hebrew text. And so, as we look at this today, some questions that might present themselves, probably should present themselves immediately are, one, uh, why is this pericope concerning the creation, the beginning of the world, why is it chosen for the baptism of our Lord? And then, of course, the second obvious question probably should be, why would you, or how could you, preach this text and talk about baptism, especially the baptism of Jesus? These are excellent questions with great merit, so I'd like to make some comments on this to begin. The first question, why is this text chosen for the baptism of our Lord, is, is not so difficult to understand, actually, as it might first appear. In our Old Testament text concerning creation, we will note the mention of water, and the Spirit of the Lord hovering over those waters. And this is how creation event begins. And in the baptism of our Lord, then we see the waters of the Jordan and the presence of the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove, again, descending in this case. But the second question is probably more complex. How would you preach this pericope as a baptismal text and point to the baptism of Jesus. Again, the presence of water in both accounts um, and this focus on a water motif is very helpful, but as we consider the totality of the creation account, as well as the whole chapter 1 of Mark, uh, important connections are revealed to us, and this is going to help us in our preaching. The creation of our world, as you know, takes place in six days and the seventh day reserved for rest. And so the number seven is understood as the uh, number of creation, even as a number of fullness or uh, completion, perhaps. However, due to the fall of man, cre creation now has been deeply disturbed by sin. Restoration of creation, or even a new creation, is needed. And so God begins to put that need into play. But instead of seven days now, the number for recreation, our new creation, becomes eight. Eight people were saved uh, on the ark by the waters of the flood. Uh, we have Eight days uh, you're circumcised in the Old Testament on the, new, on the eighth day, you know, the entering into the covenant. Uh, and all of these things then foreshadow what Christ Jesus will do for us on the cross and through, and through His resurrection. Now the church also understands that Jesus not only rises from the dead after three days in the tomb, but the day on which he rises from the dead is Sunday, the first day of the next week, or what we would say is the eighth day. And this is um, why we worship on Sunday, because it is the eighth day, resurrection day. But we also see that eight becoming as a baptismal number as we look at some of our older churches. Our older baptismal fonts have eight sides. And some older Lutheran churches, including my first parish in Iowa, they had an old, old tradition I discovered in the record books in German that, that they were baptizing on the eighth day after birth. Now, I found that wasn't so uncommon, but later the church moved away from that and actually to Sunday as they began to recognize or to think, about Sunday as always being the eighth day, and so they're still baptizing on the eighth day. So in the preaching of this Old Testament pericope, we should and could very easily incorporate both the epistle and the gospel lesson, 
the three then, the Old Testament, the Epistle, the Gospel, all seen together provide a beautiful picture of what God has done for His creation in restoring it through His Son. And indeed, Jesus has come to make all things new, and He uses water for His new creation, just as the original creation was brought forth from the waters. So let's take a look at our first verse here, Genesis 1, 1, and it's we have Bereshith, which uh, should be translated as in the beginning. Uh, I would not, and I don't think it's proper to look at it as saying when. You know, the ba here, our, our preposition is being uh, when or with, but rather in the beginning. And that's supported then by the verb bara here, the call perfect, you know, simple call perfect. Uh, when the uh, object, of course, or the subject, the verb rather is uh, Elohim, God. And that's all kind of fairly important because bara itself has a sense of um, to make something out of nothing. So creation here is an issue of bringing things out of nothing. And while man can do things like make and craft, he is not able to make something out of nothing. Ex nihilo, as we say in the Latin, out of nothing. So uh, the verb here is used concerning God's act of creation because man can't uh, be the subject of that. Okay, and now as we look then, I think perhaps, well, perhaps we should make a quick point here um, concerning this idea that the accounts, the creation accounts in Genesis 1 and then again in Genesis 2 are two creation accounts. Now, that obviously would pose a lot of difficulties and it has led to a lot of difficulties in the course of history as people have used the two accounts to um, support all sorts of agendas, everything from racism to... Uh, you name it, it's been used, this has been used to, uh, to cause all sorts of difficulties. But when you look carefully at the book of Genesis, you're going to see that it's composed of 12 distinct patriarchal accounts. And all except the very first, and this is our first, all the others begin with the words, Aleh Toldoth, which means uh, these are the generations. It's sort of like the title of each one of these. And each one then represents its own patriarchal narrative, its own patriarchal account. And so Moses, under divine guidance by the Holy Spirit, takes these patriarchal narratives, perhaps they were written, and maybe perhaps or even oral traditions passed down through the generations, but he takes those and he edits them uh, into the book of Genesis. The first two narratives then, in this uh, book of Genesis are the creation narratives. But they don't represent two creations, but rather the story of creation told from two different perspectives. Uh, if you could argue with two different agendas, you know, the first is a chronological telling that we're going through today, day one, and we're, that's all we're gonna cover, but day one, day two, day three, very chronological, kind of interesting. Uh, gives us kind of the play-by-play -play of the narrative. But the second account in Genesis 2 focuses on the all-important reality that the crown of God's creation is man. And now, in support of this, it's not the only place in Genesis we find this happening. If you look at Genesis chapter 36, you see the focus to... to um, told those two narratives focused on the same character. It happens to be Esau, of all people. But again, one is very, if you will, historical. I mean, you might argue isagogical. The other has more of a, a point of uh, focusing upon uh, some other aspects of Esau's life. So it's not an uncommon thing at all to find this in the, in the book of Genesis. So going back to the text, let's go to verse 2 then. Obviously, in the beginning, God created. 
So we have God creating here in verse 1, and we have the heavens and the earth. Now as we go to verse, verse 2, we hear some very strange things. And the earth, well, here we go. What, and this is from Hayah, the verb to be. But here's our phrase I want to point you to. Tohu wavohu. A very rare uh, construction in the Hebrew. It's only found one other place in the Masoretic text, and that would be Jeremiah. Jeremiah 4, verse 23. So we here see this again. And usually we translate this um, formless and void is probably the, um, the best way to go here. Formless and void. So th the earth was formless and void. And of course we have in darkness. And here's another phrase. Alpane, the home, and darkness was upon the face of, we have a construct chain here, upon the face of, and our tahom, our thahom rather, uh, the, the idea here is deep. Um, could also be understood though as, a, in some cases, as a primeval flood type of idea. But uh, we usually translate it as it was upon the face of the deep. Um, and it comes from that, uh, well, well, let's move on to this word up here at the end, or near the end here. And Ruach Elohim, the Spirit of God, or the, yeah, the Spirit of God. And then we have this particular phrase or this particular word, which is also somewhat rare and unusual, but it should be taken as hovering in this case. It's a participle, a PL participle, to mean hovering. Now, in, in, the, in the call, in the, uh, you would, uh, the root would mean probably something like to tremble or something like that, but in the PL, now you have hover, uh, and so the participle hovering uh, hovering uh, over the face of the face of the waters. Again, we see the construct chain, the face of the waters. Now, um, keep your eyes on this. We're going to talk about that here as we go into this verse. Uh, some very interesting things taking place in this text that perhaps we don't always uh, grab hold of right away. But here now in verse 3, And God said... Now, we hear the voice of God now. God speaks. Uh, it's very important. It's the voice of God, which is His creating word here. And God said, let there be, and there was. Let there be light, and there was light. Uh, God speaks. God speaks into existence His creation. One can also see a Trinitarian aspect then, therefore, to these, um, these three verses. You have the God, the Father, who creates. We have the Spirit of God hovering over the waters. And now we have the Word of God. And John, of course, uh, the Gospel of John clearly, in chapter 1, clearly identifies the Word as the Son. In the beginning was the Word, you know, all that. Uh, pretty familiar with that. So it's interesting to note and to see the persons of the Godhead in this account. Very important, especially as we look at the persons of the Godhead then in the baptism of Jesus. We have Jesus himself being baptized. We have the Spirit. We have the, the voice of God, the Father, speaking, this is my beloved Son. That, so you see, now you can maybe start to see why those who put together the Prickable system chose this text uh, for uh, the baptism of our Lord. Um, you could also focus on the light and the darkness aspect here, but um, for the baptism of our Lord, I might uh, probably make that secondary at this point, considering the, uh, the week of the church here that we're working with. So we go to verse 4 now. And in verse 4, we begin with, with our verb, wayara which comes from our, the root ra'ah, 
And ra'ah means, um, what's it called in perfect, means to see. It's an irregular, so you know the hay is dropped off here and all of that. So it means to see. And then we have uh, this very interesting word here, the waya, wayavdeo, wavyadeo, excuse me. The wavyadeo from badal, badal, the verb here meaning to um, separate maybe to divide from or to um, divide out from. Now, there's a little disagreement among people whether this is a hifel or a pl form. And um, an imperfect, certainly. Uh, if it's a hifel form, which I tend to lean toward personally, but if this is a hifel form, then it's easy to see that the causing agent here is God. God caused the light to be separated from the darkness. It's an action of God, which we sort of know, but the Hiphel, uh, as uh, Dr. Wenthe always told us, it's the holy Hiphel, and frequently Hiphel, the action, the causer of the action, rather, is God. So, as we go on then to verse 5, Final verse here, we see Kara showing up a couple times. And it's, it's in a kind of a declarative sense. Um, God, uh, it has an imperative sense, if you will, probably, probably Jussives in this case. Uh, but you see him saying, uh, and God called the light day called to the light day, and he called to the darkness, and to the darkness he called night. Okay, so now, though, we have this interesting thing that we find all the way through this creation account. And there was evening, and there was morning, day one. Now we're going to come back to that all the way through the verses that follow this, uh, as we re if we were to read forward, uh, but I, I guess first of all we should probably talk about this uh, notion that the Hebrew word yom, this idea of right here, Hebrew word yom, that this can be. Um, well, let's just say a lot of people give this a lot of attention as they search for the way to balance or to incorporate uh, the creation account with evolutionary science. Uh, so the question becomes, how long is a day? Or is yom used for longer periods of time than 24 hours in Hebrew? Well, the truth is yom can be used to indicate longer periods of time. Certainly we see examples of that throughout Scripture. However, in this verse, in the following verses from Genesis, you have bookends placed upon the day. There was evening and there was morning. So you have time constrictions put here. And in doing so, you end up with yom in this context with, these, uh, with what's going on around it. You have yom uh, indicating approximately, anyway, a 24-hour period. So, our Old Testament pericope really has much to offer in the preaching on the baptism of our Lord. As we read Scripture as one story, one narrative, if you will, we see how everything centers around and points us to Christ. So, we begin with our creation account here and how God intended things to be, but because of the fall then, God sends His only begotten Son to be baptized in the River Jordan. And then He takes all of our sins. The Son takes our sins upon Himself and He carries them to the cross. And thus we read in Romans 6, the epistle for today, that we are baptized with Jesus into His death that we, in order that we might rise with Him to newness of life as a new creation. So here you see how all of this can fit together. And so God bless you as you uh, 
go about your preaching tasks this Sunday. 